Hello everybody and welcome to Wilbercast. This is episode 9 for June the 30th, 2016. So, today is Thursday, tomorrow is Friday, and that means tomorrow is the beginning of the US National Championships over in America. I believe they're in Ohio this year. Anyway, um, it's the biggest tournament of the year. Not the most prestigious, of course, that's world's second most prestigious, arguably. Uh, but in terms of attendance, we're looking at over a thousand people showing up for this thing in TCG Masters. That's an awful lot of people. We don't get that over here in Europe. It's quite a huge event, and good luck to absolutely everyone who's going over for it. Uh, to help you lovely people, I'm going to be discussing what the decks are going to be like going into it, what I expect to be popular, what I expect to be good and what to be bad, and my own personal pick for what I would play if I was showing up there tomorrow. Uh, another thing that I want to discuss today is Pokepuff. It's a card in the new set Steam Siege that I did not discuss in my set review uh, last week. Uh, reason about that, reason I didn't discuss it is because I forgot it. It's not in the Japanese set, it is in our English set though, uh, and it's a very good card, so it's worth some discussion. So I'll throw that in at the start. Uh, first of all, for our YouTube viewers, you may be wondering why the splash screen this week is hideously ugly. Uh, there is a reason for this. So, I have been dealing with a plethora of laptop issues lately. Um, namely, it just, just randomly decided that it would not work with anything with Adobe in its name. It just decided, you know what, no, uh, even though the vast majority of my work is all done in Adobe software, in and outside of YouTube, uh, yeah, it's just crapped out on me and I can't use it anymore for some reason. Have no fear, new laptop order should get it Friday. Quick shout out to Brexit for making the sterling rate go down dramatically and very easy for me to get a laptop at short notice on Amazon. So that's one good thing that came out of Brexit, I guess. Um, but yeah, so anyway, uh, because I didn't have access to Adobe Illustrator, unfortunately I had to turn to Microsoft Paint and Comic Sans, and that is what you see before you. So normal service will resume next week. Um, I hope that I never design anything this ugly for as long as I live. Anyway, so yeah, before we get into everything else, um, I believe tomorrow the Pokemon Company are going to reveal some new Pokemon. Um, so by the way, Sun and Moon spoilers ahead, annotation on screen if you want to skip them. If you're not on YouTube, skip ahead like in a minute and a half, two minutes. Um, yeah, I won't be talking very long about them. That's some new Pokemon revealed, they're pretty cool. Um, all I wanted to say was that Bruxish may be the most hideous thing I have ever set my eyes on. Like, holy god. Um, it has leaped over Nose Past as the ugliest Pokemon in existence. Like, by a very wide margin. I don't even know where to begin with it. It looks like someone ate a Basculin, threw it up, and tried to reassemble it. It's, it's just absolutely horrible. Um, you're gonna get given an old rod super early on in the game, and this is gonna be all you find. I, s I swear to god, this... Does anyone actually like Bruxish? That's kind of what I wanted to touch on here. Leave a comment below with what's your favorite Pokemon um, from Gen 7 so far, because we've had some cool ones revealed so far. Uh, so yeah, let's get some discussion going. Tell me what you like from Gen 7 and what you don't like. And if you do like Brook Brooksish, please explain your reasons, because dear Jesus, this thing is a monstrosity. Um, personally, Rowlet was top of that list for quite a while, but Charge of Oak has quickly overtaken him. I love that thing. Badass evolution line. Anyway, that's going to do it for our discussion on the new Pokemon. Uh, so... Spoiler people, you can unblock your ears now. It's kind of redundant me saying that, but whatever, we'll move on anyway. So, on to the first major topic of discussion for this week. And that's going to be captivating Pokepuff. Or is it just called Pokepuff over here? Whatever, it's one of the two. Um, so, first of all, what this card does is... It's an item card, you play it, look at your opponent's hand, choose any basic Pokemon they have there, and put as many of them as you like onto their bench. So that could be zero, it could be all of them, whatever you want. Quick ruling update now. Um, I believe that Pokemon have stepped in and updated this. So I, originally what we thought was that if I grabbed a Shaman from my opponent's hand and put it on their bench, that my opponent would then have the ability to use Setup after I did that. Um, but I believe Pokemon have stepped in and updated this ruling to say that no, you can't. And that if I put a Shaman on their bench, it's just there, and they don't get to use the ability. Same goes for Hoopa, obviously, or Fungus, or anything with an ability that uh, does something when you bench it. Um, so, if I'm wrong on that, please do correct me. I think I've got this right. Um, but yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. I couldn't find it through Google, so whatever. Uh, but yeah, this card is kind of crazy. In First of all, it's a really interesting card. Haven't seen anything like this in the format, or at least for a very long time. It's basically hand scope, but better in every conceivable way. So, throw away your hand scopes from Plasma Forces. Plasma Force. What am I on? Phantom Forces. I don't know why I always call it Plasma something for some reason. 
But anyway, um, yeah, so the biggest thing that people are going to be saying this should go in is Night March, and really it's hard to disagree. Um, as it stands, if you have a Shaman on your board, Night March will kill it. If you have a Shaman in your discard pile, Night March will bring it up and kill it. The only safe places for Shamans are your deck or your hand. And now all of a sudden your hand's not safe anymore. That's a big target for Night March to now pull Shamans from and win a game even quicker than it already could. With all the new tools that it got from this set outside of Poke Buff to begin with, it's gotten a huge, huge buff and it, it, it really didn't need it. We need Karen to come as soon as possible. Um, and I'm saying this is Night March's biggest fan, I, I assure you. Uh, I think the biggest thing this helps with is like, Against Night March, a really cool tactic you can do, and I'm sure a lot of you have done before, is Sky Return for the Knockout um, to kill a Joltik. Because that way, you get a Shaman off your board, you can serve your double colorless energy or whatever energy you're using. Um, you've taken a Knockout, you take a prize, you get rid of one of their energy. Uh, there's no way to punish it. It's a really, really solid way of uh, keeping up with Night March. You can even then draw more cards next turn if you want to rebench it. It's... You know, it's 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 kind of the universally accepted way of this is an all right tactic to use against Joltics. All of a sudden, that becomes a really, really, really easy to punish, like and hard. This is a first of all, you can shame and sky return from like an empty hand and be safe because you know you can bench it again next turn. Now you can't do that because they'll they'll poke a puff. You have to put the shaman back on your board. There's a big target. You're gonna lose two prizes. And you can't draw any more cards next turn. That's horrible. You've we've taken away one of the biggest ways of dealing with Night March, and just made it into something that's a really risky move. And it's it's a very very interesting card to get for the deck. And I think for that reason, the biggest use for this card in Night March will be against uh, will be will be against the Mirror Match, because it basically means that you know Sky Return for the Knockout's great in that because conserving your energy is so important in the Mirror Match. Uh, but now all of a sudden, it's just such a hard punish. I mean, maybe if you combine this, like your Sky Returns with Item Locks or Hex Maniacs or something, it could be more difficult for um, Night March to pull off this combo. But as it stands, that's just stupid. It's looking like Worlds is just going to be Night March and Trevenant. And again, I hope this is... We've we've seen a lot of tools coming in for Night March lately, uh, like Special Energy Charge. Pokemon Ranger is going to be great in Night March as well. Maybe even Ninja Boy, if that ends up being cool in it. Um... There's a lot of new tools for Night March to play around with, and it's going to require a lot of testing to see which ones make the cut and which ones don't. Because how do you even find space for all of this stuff? Um, so yeah, it's going to be really interesting looking at that going forward. But at the end of the day, it seems like having so many options like that is the opposite of a problem. And it's making Night March into a deck that is is just going to be super crazy good. And again, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I play around with these cards and find, actually, you know what? It's not as good as it was on paper. Like Mega Alakazam. I don't know if it's going to be the case. Especially Special Energy Charge. That looks stupid. So anyway, that's going to do it for Pokebuff. Um, we're moving on to my US Nationals discussion. Um, and I'm gonna how I'm going to structure this is I'm just going to discuss some decks. Timestamps will be in the description so you can skip to whichever one you want. Um... Basically, I think the ones I want to focus on the most are the two new surprise decks that sort of came in. So, uh, people try and keep secret decks for Nats all the time. Uh, obviously, Waylord blew up last year, and that was a big deck that came out of the trump card ban. Uh, but this year, we've had two sort of surprise decks that have been revealed a little early for Nats. Those were the Metal Genesec deck and um, Darkrai Giratina Garbodor. So, Metal Genesec, let's talk about this one first. Uh, we saw this one over in Italy. It won the Italian... No, it didn't win. It came second in the Italian National Championships. It won in our hearts. Um, piloted by the immensely talented Simone Zucchelli. And it looked really impressive when he was playing it. I think it was one of those things that a lot of people looked at the card and said, you know what, this isn't the kind of format where a high HP EX comes in and beats all these non-EX decks. But he really proved that it was capable of doing that and that this actually is a format suit to Genesect, because looking at the list of decks that are also popular, there's really not a whole lot of them that pose much trouble to Genesect. Like, let's have a look at Night March, okay? On paper, awkward. You've got a lot of EXs, Night March doesn't. That's what Night March likes. But then you remember that this deck can get away with things like Assault Vest and multiple Fury Belts, and it has Aegislash EX, which resists Psychic and has that amazing ability that prevents damage done if we have a double colorless on our Pokemon. So cool, all of a sudden we've got this great answer to Night March, but okay, argument. Night March can chain Hex Maniacs. 
very easily. Night March, if they're running Megaphone, a lot of people dropped this because some people were, um, because there wasn't a lot of Giratina in the format, so a lot of people did drop, um, what am I saying a lot? I mean people dropped the Zerasic, so people do still have the Megaphone in, um, but they don't run Megaphone and Zerasic now. It's seems like people are leaning towards just one or the other. Um, if they're just running Zerasic, and they Zerasic off the tool, okay, now they can't Hex Maniac and they can't kill um, the Edge Slash. Uh, but if they're running a Megaphone, they need to Megaphone and then Hex so that they can get the attack off. If they Hex, means they can't attack with Mew. Um, with basic energy, that's one way of getting around the Assault Vest and the ability, but it still resists Psychic, so you need quite a lot of Pokemon in the discard pile, and plus people are kind of dropping the Mew from the Nightmarch lists as well. Like I myself was running the 1-1 Vespic one line, a lot of people picked up on that. Um, so if they're not running Mew, which most builds honestly aren't, they're going to have to attack with a Joltik and Hex. Now this can be annoying because it stops the uh, it stops the Metal player from using Bronze Zones to power up uh, another attacker to kill the to kill the Joltik. But one thing that does play in the favor is that because of the resistance, it basically forces the Nightmarsh player to use Joltiks. And if they're using Joltiks, they become ridiculously weak to Bronze Zong Break, which can just basically pick off the entire board at once. So, it's something that Nightmarsh players have to be really careful about. Um, it's it, it's not that you auto win against Nightmarsh, I definitely don't think you do. I think Nightmarsh can still outspeed you for one thing, and just win prize trades. Um, but you can definitely make it very, very awkward for them to win. So that's a big, big strength of the deck. Um, and Nightmarch is popular, and making Nightmarch an awkward win for it is like... That's a good asset to have. Not a lot of decks can boast that. Second of all, we're talking Frogs. Frogs is um, not a difficult... I mean, not... I don't want to say it's a difficult matchup. Uh, we saw Simone himself beat it in, I believe it was top four, with that wonderful Age of Slash Dong. Who could forget that? Um... I think the big thing about it is, first of all, you've got the Bronzong, the new one that prevents Shadow Stitching from shooting off your uh, Metal Lynx Bronzongs. That's a great asset to have. It basically means that you can set up a Genesect and continuously kill what it, whatever's in the active spot, even if it's a Greninja break. It's not difficult to do that at all. And being able to just to stream KOs like that on top of comfortably being able to Hex Maniac just before you declare your attack to um, tank a few hits yourself and keep going with the same Genesect over and over again. Um, you've got a lot of options to beat Frogs. You can make it difficult for it just to be really simple things with the Hex Maniac and with the straight up, okay, I'm going to blast you for like 200 damage. I don't care that you've got a hard charm on. Um, yeah, I think it's got a lot of things going for it against that. Um, Vespa and Vileplume. You run Aegislash. A lot of Vespa and Vileplume players drop their Aegislash counters. So if you get that thing out, you actually just auto win. Um, also, I know Simone only ran one in his list, but I imagine a lot of players will be upping it to two. Not, I don't, I, not that I'm saying that they should, but I think a lot of people will at least experiment with multiple copies of Edge of Slash in the deck. And uh, for Vesquim Vileplume, beating one Edge of Slash, easy, no problem. Beating two Edge of Slash, kind of difficult. That's that's a little bit different. Um, yeah, that that becomes a lot harder. Uh, you give your opponent a lot more turns. On top of that, it's also just got a lot of EX Pokemon, and that's actually something Vesquim Vileplume doesn't like to deal with. Um, anyone who's played it knows that if you're getting 130 damage off turn one, that's good. That's what you, <laughs> that's ideal. That's like a that's like a high number to be hitting turn one. Um, it's definitely a deck that was built to deal with the non EX decks. Uh, no, I think I think Metal should be having a decent time against that. Trevenant, okay, yes, he he did lose in the finals to a Trevenant deck because Trevenant has turn one item lock and that's just strong against everything. But on paper, you still have a good Trevenant matchup, and he said himself that he still felt his Trevenant matchup was good. Uh, we're talking, you've got a resistance to Psychic, so your opponent is forced to use Silent Fears, but you can stop Silent Fear with the new Bronzong, in which case they're forced to Tree Slam for 40 damage, which is not an awful lot of damage. Um, so you're really quelling the amount of output that that thing has. Also, you can just one-shot break, super easy. Um, yeah. You really should have an okay time against Trevenant. Uh, again, if they go first, they get the item lock up. That's the point of Trevenant. You don't do very well after that. Uh, your max elixirs are offline, whatnot. But other than that, you should have an okay time against it, I reckon. Waterbox, you can probably trade prizes with this thing really well. 
Um, you can knock them out in one hit. They can't knock you out in one hit unless they're running Aurora's EX, but that's weak to metal, so that sort of creates a whole other problem. Um, like, because, yeah, okay, Seismato's okay. You can grenade hammer for, what, 130? But Genesec can kind of come in and kill the Seismato in one hit. It's not a huge issue. Um, they have Regice to stop your AEX attackers, but then you've got Bronzong with Hammer In for 60, which will hit Regice for weakness and do exactly 120 damage to kill it. So, yeah, you have an answer for everything in that deck. I wouldn't be afraid of Waterbox. Um, yeah, Metal has great matchups across the board. Really fantastic deck. Against YZG as well. Um, I think Zorork might be, be a bit of an issue, just because uh, you have to have a high bench size in the first place. And also, you just they've got a lot of non-EX attackers you don't. Uh, but I'll come back to Zorork in a minute. Maybe the Bronzong Break can help out in that matchup. But I'll come back to Zorork in a, a minute, a little bit later on this this week's episode. Uh, I think the one really, really difficult matchup for this deck is going to be Mega Ray Quaza. So, basically, not only does Mega Ray itself have a ridiculously high damage output, it's going to be able to eat through all of your Genesects, all of your Aegislashes, um, because they run multiple copies of Hex, so the ability shouldn't matter too much. Uh, if they really have to sit back and build up, they can start attacking with Jolteon instead. Um, and really, what do you attack with to beat the Jolteon? Not only does it prevent the abilities, um, not only does it actually stop all basics attacking it, which your deck is fully basic attackers, it's also got a metal resistance. Uh, the only thing that can really get around it is the Bronzong Break, but that which attack does not actually apply weakness and resistance, so that's kind of cool. Um, but then you need to commit quite a lot of energy to that thing, and if you're doing that, Mega Ray will come in, kill that, Probably Hex Maniac at the same time, so you can't get all the energy back onto something else. And now all of a sudden you're just you've just lost the game. I I think Mega Ray could be a really difficult matchup for it. Um, so yeah, but that's Metal. Great matchups across the board. If you if you went into the tournament playing Metal, I think that's a great pick. I think it's a really solid deck, um, and I think it'll really. I think I wouldn't be surprised to see it hit top eight. I really wouldn't. Um, Dark Ride Giratina Garbodor is the next secret deck. This sort of got revealed a bit before Nats. It sort of just entered the format at a, at a brand new point. And um, how do I feel about it? I like it a lot. I think it's got some very cool matchups. Um, against Night March, having Giratina and Garbodor is fantastic. And like I said, a lot of Night March players are just dropping their Giratina counters, like Enhanced Hammer and Zerasic, sort of are leaving some lists. Um, I feel in order to be able to consistently beat Giratina, um, in Toad Tina, you needed to run both Enhanced Hammer and um, Zerasic. But the difference here is that Giratina will be powered up with probably like a Double Dragon and then two Darks. Uh, so you can only get rid of one and they only need to reattach one energy to keep going. Um, and this becomes a much harder job to consistently get rid of their energy when they're also running Garbodor. So you can't shame it into your resources. Um, yeah, Giratina's got an awful, awful lot going for it. Um, you can't even Fury Belt a Shaman and to keep Sky Return looping them because obviously Giratina shuts off the DCE and the Fury Belt this is... I, I don't know, I think it could be a really, really awkward time for Night March. Um, it's, there is again the case that, okay, you go first, you bench Giratina, you pass, Night March plays Catcher or Lazan brings it up, turn 1, 180, go to hell. Like, that can happen, of course. Um, that's kind of what a lot of Nightmarch decks are built to do. But, hey, you never know. If you're if you're playing for the long game, that should be okay. And really, just if you get up one Tina and a Garb at some point, you should be in a pretty good position. So, yeah, Nightmarch definitely winnable. Um, looking at Frogs, the Garbodor is so, so, so good against Frogs. I was actually debating putting a Garbodor in my list for UK Nationals. Um, I played Vespaquin Zorork, if, for those of you who don't know. Uh, and I didn't in the end because I felt that the only thing it actually beat was frogs. And that is true. Garbodor helps out fro against frogs immensely. Um, they rely so much on their abilities, especially against big HP Pokemon, because, like, Moonlight Slash isn't going to do a whole lot to a Giratina with a Fury Belt on it, um, or to a Darkrai with a Fury Belt on it, which is probably what attacker you'd be using there. Um, like, night, of course, Moonlight Slash in combination with a bunch of other abilities. Now that's fantastic. That'll work. That'll that'll probably kill the Darkrai in one hit. But the Garbodor is what really stops that and really creates it, an, an awkward disposition for Greninja. I think that means a lot of Greninja players now need to start looking at Zerasic into the list. I know a lot of players ran that anyway, but I think 
I'd really, really want a way of dealing with that garb if I was playing frogs. Now, of course, like if you use Airsick it off and then use your abilities to kill the garb, you'd need two giant water shurgans to do it, but it is possible. You can then kind of swing the matchup straight back in your favor that way. But no, on on paper, it really should be in Dark Ritina Garb's favor. Uh, we're looking at Vesquim Vilebloom. First of all, no one's really playing Vesquim Vilebloom. Um, and you've got Tina. <laughs> like, technically, you can get the Garbodor up and be very good from there. But Kiratina is very, very, very good against Vesquim Vilebloom. Um, yeah, I, I feel like the Vesquim Vileplume players, some of them are running, like, Jolteon EX as a way to sort of circumvent this. Um, I don't know. I feel like that's not going to be super popular anyway. But Tina should make short work of anything with special energy. Like, uh, should make short work of Vesquim Vileplume because it relies so much on special energy and has no real way of shutting off the Tina or killing it before it becomes powerful. Uh, so, yeah, that's how that matchup rolls. Uh, Trevenant, you've got Darkrai and Garbodor. Th those are two really good answers to Trevenant, especially because you only really need one window with which to get your Garbodor up. If you get a Trubbish Floatstone down at any point, you're solid set to go for that matchup. Waterbox. You know what? Waterbox has a lot of abilities in it. Um, Garbodor stops that. Basically, that deck relies so, so heavily on uh, being able to use Manaphy's ability to free retreat everything. Garbodor just makes that so much more difficult. Um, you'd probably want to be attacking with Darkrai in that matchup, of course. Um, it's probably leveling the damage output that they can do to you. Um, but again, like I was saying sort of about um, about this earlier, is that Waterbox doesn't actually have anything that can just hit 180 damage, or 170 even. Um, Aurora's EX with a Fury Belt can hit 170. That's a lot of commitment. Not a lot of people are playing it. And if you're really worried about a Aurora CX with four energy on it, run a Veltal EX. You'll make short work of that thing. Um, yeah, no, I think this thing should be beating Waterbox. Mega Rayquaza, well, Giratina is kind of an issue for that. I mean, again, the Jolteon could be something you need to play around, but um, I think that's something you'll have to work out. Because, again, let's not forget Giratina has an ability that actually stops damage from Megas. It's actually easy to forget that Giratina has that ability because the rest of Giratina is so damn good. Um, so, no, I think Darkrai Giratina is arguably even in a better spot uh, than Metal is. And I think I'd be leaning towards it more. The only issue with it is that people are kind of going to be going to be prepared for it. Like, it's it's just sort of blown up over the last week or two. We all know about it now. I don't think anyone's going to be going into this tournament, anyone prepared is going to be going into this tournament without having an answer to this deck. Or without at least being prepared to face it. So, there you go. Um, What else we got listed down here? Okay, so on to sort of the old hats, the big favorites, the ones that I think a lot of people are championing right from the get-go. Hey, it's Night March. We all love Night March. Um, we all know what this thing can do. How people build Night March is going to be interesting because I could see people putting Mew back in. Um, first of all, for Edge of Slash against the Metal decks. Um, that'll help out against Bronzong Break as well because you're not using Joltik. Excellent. That's a great plus. Um, and the basic energy means it'll be easier to get around the Edge of Slash. It also provides an answer to Giratina EX, which otherwise will be a big issue in Dark Ritina Garb. Um, and a plus with Frogs, sort of. A lot of answers to frogs are popping up, which means running the Vespa Gwyn is now less necessary than it was before. You can beat Waterbox anyway, okay? You you don't really need the Vespa Gwyn to beat Waterbox. Um, but beating frogs is now less important, and I'd argue it's more important to beat the Metal deck and beat the Gar Darkrai Giratina Garbodor deck. And um, Like, you can still beat frogs even with the Mew in, without the Vespa Gwyn in the deck, it's just harder. Um, so no, I think the Mew kind of provides those answers. And maybe now, finally, this is the time where Mew will get its chance to shine in Night March. As for the counts of energy, oh man, uh... I was, I think one Mew, two basic energy? One Mew, one basic energy? Uh, maybe two Mew, one basic energy? It's really hard to say. It's something you're going to need to test around with. Um, I haven't actually done much testing with Mew after I was sort of like, you know what, I prefer uh, Vespa Gwent greatly. Uh, the other thing you could run is my Zeb Strike a list, uh, which means you will be able to hit through Edge of Slash. Still not going to really help you with the Giratina matchup, but hey, what can you do? Um, yeah, so you can still hit through 
uh, Aegis Lash EX if you have the Zip Strike on the field. Um, I think Jolteon's got a lot of sort of good matchups coming in here. Zip Strike is an answer to Jolteon if you're playing Night March. So, eh, I guess. I mean, I really, I just want to see someone do well with Night March Zip Strike it, but ignore me. <laughs> so yeah, no, I think Trevenant's still going to be super popular, and that's something I'd watch out for as a Night March player as well. Um, again, another reason to run Zip Strike it, you can knock out Trevenant's in one hit with it. It's a great card. Um, but yeah, I think it's not as strong of a pick as it could be at the moment. I think a lot of the decks that are generating hype are sort of providing issues for it. And like I said, Trevenant is still a thing, and man, that's not a nice matchup. I guess Night March can beat Trevenant, but if you're going into a tournament expecting a lot of Trevenants, you probably shouldn't be running Night March in the first place. Um, so right now, I'm not quite sure. Frogs, I think, sort of is in the same position. Unfortunately, I don't think Greninja Break can keep up with Dark Rotina Garb. I don't think it can keep up with Metal. Um, Trevenant, again, is kind of still looking like a really good deck. And Frogs has a terrible time against that thing if it gets off to a bad start. Mega Rayquaza can even be a bit of an issue, and I've been mentioning decks that are weak to Mega Rayquaza. The one thing it does have going for it now is that it's got an answer to Waterbox with Hard Charm. That's cool. Waterbox does not seem to have adapted to that change yet. Uh, it's also good against Vespa and Vile Bloom. I think, okay, Waterbox adapting to that change, just to ba go back to this point, is you include a Roar CX in the list to knock out the brakes in one hit. But even then, you've still got the Hard Charm um, to take you down from 170 HP. The Ro a Roar will hit 170, and Greninja will tank that hit because it has Hard Charm on it. Like So, so Waterbox really needs to be running some kind of tool discard to sort of help it deal with those things. Um, but anyway, moving on from that point. Um... Vespuquin Vileplume is seeing basically no play at the moment. Vespuquin variants are still winnable for Greninja. Um, if you go first, I've mentioned this before, I think, but if you go first against a Vespuquin kind of toolbox deck as the Frogs player, you put yourself in a very good position, actually, and uh, Vespuquin will need to go out of its way to sort of come back from that. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, on the one hand, a big threat for it in Vespuquin Vileplume has just died. Um, but I think new threats have emerged, especially now that people, I think, are looking at Garbodor. Um, not even just in Dark Rigority and a Garbodor, but a lot of people are just seeing the Garbodor and thinking, you know what, that's a good card. We should put this in a lot of other things. And um, I don't know, I wouldn't be surprised to see some sort of weird deck come out that was just like, oh, it's a regular deck, but it's got Garbodor in it. Um, and that, like, it instantly gives you a better time against frogs. And now you don't you have a reason to run the Garbodor outside of just beating frogs, because it's good against metal, and it's good against water box, and it's good against ray, and it's good against trevenant. You've got multiple reasons to run this thing um, outside of just against frogs. So, I don't know, I think it's a, it's a riskier pick than it otherwise would be. But hey, you know what? It can still pull off amazing things. And yeah, I think a lot of people know the deck well, so a lot of people will just sort of be relying on that familiarity and playing it anyway. Vespuk and Vileplume, unfortunately, I've been trying to make a list that works for it. Um, a lot of things are just conspiring against it in the meta. Uh, namely, Frogs, one of its auto wins, like I said, is now less of a dominant force than it was when Vespuk and Vileplume Bloom first. Um, like, at least with UK Nationals, when it won that, Frogs was everywhere, and now it's not everywhere. And that's sort of... It. One of its auto wins is just sort of gone. Um, Trevenant... <sighs> I don't like that matchup at all, because there's no real way you can control it. You just sort of hope you flip heads at the start of the game. Uh, Tina, like I said, is now coming back. That's a big issue for Vespa and Vile Bloom. Uh, even the metal deck, like I mentioned, is a big problem for it. You know, I think the, the format is shifting back more towards EX decks. And away from the non-EX decks. It's, sort of, it's allowing space for these big EX Pokemon to come in and be good once again. And um, Vespa and Vileplume, anyone who's played it, you know, like I said before, you know if you're hitting 130 damage turn 1, you're doing well. It's not built to deal with big EX decks. It was built for a format that was uh, very non-EX dominated. And, I mean, f don't get me wrong, turn 1 item lock is still good. It always has been, it always will be. But there's just so many decks now that have good answers to it. Sort of unintentionally, almost that it's hard for me to recommend it anymore. Which is sad, because I like the deck, and I tried to make it work, but eh, I don't think I can do it. Um, anyway, while the format is shifting back towards big EX decks, this is very good news for Mega Rayquaza fans, because 
Mega Rayquaza isn't good against non EX decks. Not not a huge amount of non EX decks anyway. Um, it preys off of decks that run high counts of and like really rely heavily on attacking with big HP two prize attackers. Because Mega Ray will sweep them from turn one turn two onwards. It's just got that ability in it. That's exactly what it wants to do, and this is a format where it's being allowed to do that again. Like I said, it's metal matchup will be great. It's Dark Ray Giratina Garbodor matchup should be pretty good too. Um, okay, yes, ignoring the Tina. It does run multiple copies of Hex Maniac, so it should be able to work around that. Um, and it runs Mega Turbos and Basic Energies. You can probably power one up without having to uh, without having to use Double Colorless Energy and be kind of caught out by Chaos Wheel. Um, yeah, I like Mega Ray. I really, I really do. I think the the one thing you would not want to face off against as a Mega Ray player at the moment is Night March. Um, and Zorork, again, I'll get to Zorork in a second. But Night March is still not very good for it. Yes, you have the really quirky Jolteon, AZ up everything, Sacred Ash everything back in, hope they don't play Zerisic sort of gamble. Um, <laughs> but no, 9 times out of 10 you're not going to be beating Night March. And regardless of its position in the meta, I don't think Night March is ever going to drop in popularity. So hey, there you go. A uh, bit of a risky play, but if you hit the right matchups, you're going to have a very easy path to top, to day two. Uh, Waterbox. I think now that the surprise has died down and we've all just sort of accepted it as part of the metagame, its influence has waned. Um, again, its its metal matchup isn't fantastic. Its Dark Giratina Garbodor matchup. It's probably winnable, but the Garbodor is going to be super, super annoying. Frogs, the, the one deck that it basically auto wind against before, now has a good answer to it, and it doesn't seem like Waterbox has fully recovered from that. Uh, Night March can still beat it. Uh, Mega Ray, like I'm saying, coming back in, should still beat it. It does have a pretty good Trevenant matchup, I can see it. But that's it. I don't know, I don't think I'd be running Waterbox. I, I can't really see much of a reason to run it over all of the other decks that I've just been mentioning. So anyway, that's my thoughts on it. Uh, Trevenant. I think is still very, very good. Um, we saw it even beat Metal, um, despite all of the precautions Simon, Simone Zucali had taken to beat it. Um, it still won out and still took the Italian National Championships. It's still been topping Nats all over Europe and all over South America, Asia, where, wherever they else have been to be having Nats. Trevenant's always relevant and always good. It's got a fantastic Night March matchup. It's got a it's got an unbelievable Night March matchup, and that's something not a lot of decks can boast. I, again, Night March can win it. It's just not pretty at all, and you don't want to be going into a tournament playing Night March expecting a lot of Trevenant. It's not fun. Um, yeah, yeah. Again, even against things like YZG, you've got the weakness policies to deal with that. It's got answers to a lot of things. It's got really consistent turn one item luck. Really is, I mean, you could go in with Trevenant and be very confident about, okay, no matter what my opponent flips over, I feel I have an answer to this. With just a really simple, consistent deck. And that's just not a lot of things that a lot of people can boast. Um, Dark Ray Giratina Garbodor could be very difficult, though. And I think you will need the weakness policies for that one. So, I, yeah, I think a lot of people will be running Trev with weakness policy for that reason. Another reason Trev should run weakness policies is Dark. And you might be wondering why I haven't really mentioned YZG or Dark a lot of this. And that's because I'm saving it for last. Because if I was going to US Nationals tomorrow, on Friday, I would be playing YZG. Well, actually, I say YZG, that's a lie. I would be playing Straits O'Rourke, a kind of YZG variant. So, I think this thing, I think Straits O'Rourke actually has the best matchups across the board. And I think it's something that, I mean, I'm personally familiar with the deck and I've played it a decent bit myself. Uh... I think it's a really simple deck that is actually in a very good position. So, first of all, let's say we got we got what? Four fours of work, like two breaks. That's probably standard for it. That's what my list is anyway. Um, what do we beat? Okay, metal. High bench sizes. Cool, we'll take care of those. High HP non EXs by the time they get a Bronzong break powered up. They're not going to be clearing your board like they can with, say, Night March. So, that's, that's something that's definitely in your favor. You're going to be winning the prize trade, even if you're two shotting them. Um, you've got a Veltal EX, if you want to, I'd run one copy of a Veltal EX, just because there's a lot of um, high HP Pokemon that require a lot of energy to do a lot of damage, and that's where a Veltal EX comes in. So, 
you've got that at your disposal. So it's got answers to beat metal. Darkrai Giratina Garbodor. Okay, so Rourke Break eats Giratina for breakfast, alright? The Garbodor will shut off your stand-ins, so what? Uh, you, you can work around that, no problem. Um, Night March is a very winnable matchup for it too. You probably run multiple copies of Target Whistle, and you can definitely avoid playing Shamans um, much easier than the Night March deck can. So you can beat that. Water Box, high bench sizes, EXs with lots of energy attachments on them. Hello of Elta all EX, hello the Rourke, that's what you want to be preying on. Um, frogs, I've always found this matchup difficult. I know some players haven't, some players think, okay, I can just copy um, Shadow Stitching and I can use Hex Maniacs and stuff like that. Um, again, you, you have an answer to it, I've always found it kind of awkward, but Frogs I think is dropping a little bit in play, so maybe you can come in there. Trevenant, even if they're running weakness policies, you can work around that. Fright Knight of Eltal is very good in that instance because you can pick off Shamans on the bench, and you can also still hit the Trevenant for weakness, and you don't get affected by Bursting Balloon. Oh man, it, you've got answers to that. And if they're not running weakness policy, you're going to floor them. Um, Mega Rayquaza, Zorork's best friend. Just You, you destroy it. I, I mean, they, they fill their bench, and cool, Zorork's away. Um, you can even copy Emerald Break and fill your own bench if they're being conservative. Uh, I think it's got answers to everything. What would my list look like? Would I run the Gallade? No. Uh, there's too much item lock. There's not really much the Gallade helps out with. I don't think it's worth it. Uh, would I run a Veltali X? I think I'd run one. Because I think it'll help out against Darkrai Giratina Garbodor. I think it'll help out even against like Vespaguin variants. Like like the Vespaguin Toolbox variants as opposed to Vespaguin Vileblume. Um, actually both really. A Veltali X is better against Vespaguin than a lot of people give it credit for. And if they're not running Raichu in theirs in their builds, um, it's actually going to have a pretty decent time. And against Waterbox as well, if Vel um, Veltali X is pretty good. Um, so yeah, I think I'd run one of those. It would be like a 4-4 line as a Rourke, two breaks, um, three babies um, of XY and generations and stuff like that, and then one Fright Knight. Um, you could go up to two Fright Knight, I guess, if you wanted to, but I think one's always suited me fine. So something like that. That's what my list would look like. Um, you'd obviously be including Muscle Band, Giovanni, Reverse Valley, all those tricks that this deck has at its disposal. And uh, on top of that, it hasn't really seen a whole lot of play. Um, so it might be a huge surprise for a lot of people. I don't think people are going to be prepared for this deck as well as they are other decks. It, of course, it made top four UK Nats. Of course, um, I believe it won a States over in US. But that's it. Especially in over US, it didn't do anything super major other than winning that one States. Really, weirdly enough, I think this could be Zorork's. This is a meta that could really, really be dominated by Zorork if he comes in at US Nats tomorrow. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised to see the thing take take home the whole thing. So, that has been my US Nationals preview. This has been Woobercast. Thank you very much for watching. We'll be back every Thursday, 5 p.m. British Standard Time. Sorry if this episode was a bit later, by the way. Um, I got caught up with a few things. But whatever. Um. Yeah, check us out on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash woopercast, soundcloud.com slash woopercast, woopercast on Stitcher and tune in. That's a lot of links. Thank you very much for watching. My name has been Joe Yates. As always, please like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I will see you next time.